All right, so it's, um, it's uh, my computer says 601 on Thursday, December 17th. Um, and I'm gonna call the regular select board meeting to order. Um, first thing is to set and set adjust the agenda. Do we have uh, any changes? Does anybody have anything? No, hearing none. We're gonna roll with the agenda we have, which is good because it's blessedly short. Maybe won't we won't have another long, long meeting. Um, all right, so next up is um, to approve minutes from last time, which was December the 3rd. Um, does anybody have anything they want changed on that or want to make a motion to approve them? I move we approve the minutes of December 3rd as written. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 So I count Lucian, Sherry, Wiz, me, and Kaylee has an aye. Okay, good. Um, so motion passes, those are the minutes. What do I, um, do I need to, somebody will email me the signature sheet and I'll sign it and scan it and send it back? Is that what we're gonna do? Yes, I'll send it to you. And don't I owe you some other signature sheets? Probably. All right. If you're if if you run across them when when you're sending this, send a okay. reminder. Thank we'll you. Do. <laughs> um. All right. Next up is communication from the audience. If anybody wants to address the board about anything that's not on our agenda, now is the now is the time to do that. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> Hi, if I may, I, I, I understood that I that what I wanted to speak about was not on the agenda, so I didn't really plan for that. So if I may speak just for a minute or two now. Yeah, that, that's what this is for. Okay, thank you. And it's about the Conservation Commission. Wait, um, Rachel. Wait, that's on the, that's on the agenda, isn't it? Oh, You're number three. To get it, 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 it is on the agenda, but when I, um, I thought I was too late, so I wasn't planning that, but I can, it's, I can, I can wait, but um, I just thought maybe I could, would you like me to wait until later? You, no, if you want, you want to just tell us something now and then that's well, fine. Well, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't mind if you're willing. Um, Go ahead. And it's, 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 um, it's just has to do with planning our funding at some point, um, we want to move ahead on the natural resource inventory um, through the Conservation Commission. And um, it's going to, you know, a ballpark figure was fifteen to $18,000. So I, we want to get some idea, like how to plan for the future for this, um, that I guess, with a combination of town funds and um, we could look into grants or matching or I'm not sure exactly, but we would just like to know a little bit more about the process on how the commission could um, apply for some funding on it. And I know it's too late for this year, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I just wanted to put it out there and if there's, um, uh, if I could get some direction, if we could get some direction on how to learn more about the process um, and what we would be expect, how would we, we be expected to handle it for, you know, an item like that. I mean, we can't slip that into the budget at this point, not this year. Because um, we, I think we have about $1,500 right now. So, um, so a little direction on, on how we could plan for maybe next year. Uh, that's was uh, all I wanted to talk about tonight. So does the league offer workshops on how to write grant proposals, how to organize a grant proposal, where you can, where to find funding agencies? We now have a town employee who's well-versed in these things. Oh, well, that's right. That's yeah. his job. Yes. That, and there's also board training that the league will offer, I think, for certain things and, and you know, 
board training wouldn't be a bad idea to talk about fundraising and other ideas alternative to having the town pay for, you know, what do other towns do? How do they do it? Mm -hmm. right. So there are two fairly concrete um, ideas. You can contact um, Jeff Sawicki, um, who's our new community development coordinator. You can get to him through Sean. And uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns is what we're referring to. And they do offer a bunch of trainings. And um, yeah, they uh, their website, I think, usually has is when the training. I don't know how that's working right now, their trainings, but oh. probably virtually. Everything's virtual for uh, VLCT right now. Okay, well, I think that's that's enough. If Jeff, Jeff's a wiki, I'll just start a conversation just so we yeah. can start planning for the long term. Right. So, uh, all right, all right thanks, just, very, you, thanks very much. I'll just take off then. Rachel, you can reach out to me and I can just make sure we get the introductions in order and be glad to oh, assist that's with great. that. Yep. Thank you very much, Sean. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rachel. See you later. <laughs> okay. okay. Bye bye. <laughs> Um, all right, so next next up is um, town manager's report, it's Sean Fielder. Uh, good evening, everybody. So um, I have a couple items here. We, uh, after um, a year and a half now, I believe, since we had the Bridgman roof uh, collapse on our reservoir, we did finally get official notice that we've got a completed um, project. So that's good news. You know, obviously that was a pretty challenging infrastructure issue to be dealing with, but um, we have our um, construction complete notice. So for next steps, what the um, drinking water program uh, will be doing is uh, just uh, figuring out, okay, what is the final grant? What are the final uh, financing numbers looking at? So we don't have that data as of yet, but we will be getting it uh, moving forward. So it's good to have that one uh, turnkey, if you will. The uh, task force that uh, stepped up to the plate here to just review what we have for pedestrian bridge um, options moving forward um, has been meeting and we will continue to meet and uh, our new uh, community development coordinator Jeff Sawicki is assisting on this and helping with some administrative tasks uh, Wiz and um, Sherry as well as uh, Tracy Martin are uh, involved with the conversations now uh, we'll just as a reminder, we'll be doing a report to the board on January 21st as far as just the scenarios, the options, what we've been investigating for funding opportunities. So that will be more information will be provided on the 21st. We have, um, uh, you know, good, uh, we have some options and obviously we'll get more uh, information in order at this uh, uh, upcoming uh, January select board meeting. I did follow up with and have connected with the representative from NVDA in regards to the Glenside and Mill Street intersection. I recall we had a petition uh, this last six or eight weeks from citizens to uh, install a traffic light at that particular intersection. Uh, very low probability of having a light, but Doug is assisting. Doug uh, Morton is the contact. He's assisting with just evaluating the intersection. Um, what I, uh, with a conversation late last week with Doug, what I relate to him is, you know, if you can just give me any additional input feedback uh, with, you know, from your perspective as a transportation as, uh, expert, I'd like to have that for the January 7th select board meeting. So I should have more at the January 7th select board meeting. Um, uh, some uh, just unfortunate situation. We do, because of the state guidance currently with the state of emergency and uh, how we operate recreational facilities, Unfortunately, this year, we're not at this time going to be able to have the ice rink active at the Atkins Field area. So I want to make sure everybody is aware of this. I wish we could go a different direction, but the recreational guidance basically just talks about having one family at a time, um, you know, if that at a given location. So been in communications with the recreation department as well as um, uh, CAE contacts in regards to this approach and, um, you know, hopefully you know, I, I don't know that this is going to change this winter, but, uh, you know, next year, um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, go in the right direction. We'll have our ice back in order. So just sorry, but that's what it is for right now, folks. Uh, continuing to get information in order on the uh, town lot in East Hardwick. So um, our town attorney is investigating some uh, details mm -hmm. on that. And then we're also uh, just trying to check um, 
what would be a, a reasonable price. And recall, we've got uh, some neighbors in uh, East Hardwick that have uh, come forward and said they'd be interested in purchasing the lot. So we're, we're keeping the details going on that. Alberta has been assisting me on that process as well. So I appreciate her help. So uh, I'll know more, I think by the January 7th meeting, we'll have more details. So I'll follow up with everybody on that. I've kept contact with the um, neighbors that have um, shown interest. So we're keeping an open channel with them and the timing is fine. They're comfortable with where we're at in regards to the process. Um, we've already talked tonight about our new community development coordinator. And uh, we just found out today that um, the town has been lucky enough to receive a $10,000 grant for a recreational grant award that's come from Vermont Community Foundation. So this is something that um, Jeff and I were uh, just getting some information uh, in order late last week and uh, Jeff took the lead on uh, submitting the uh, proposal to VCF this past Monday. This obviously was on a fast uh, track. And um, this is great news. I mean, right out of the gates, we've got a, you know, we've got a $10,000 award. So I'm, you know, this is awesome. I'm really excited about this. In a nutshell, what we're looking at without getting into a lot of details is just further promoting uh, this uh, uh, our, our recreational uh, economy and having some kiosks in town and at some of these parking locations, whether it's at Wright Farm, um, whether it's uh, at uh, just off the LVRT, it's just getting, you know, when we get back to the new normal, we're going to have a lot of visitors for this recreational economy and it's going to be directing people to our uh, downtown areas and, uh, you know, getting them patronizing our businesses and taking advantage of not just the businesses, but the historical, you know, things we have to offer and, you know, good community. So it's a positive, uh, really happy about this. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're also, uh, you know, doing a, a comprehensive track of uh, other opportunities that are out there. So we've got a couple of things that are in the works uh, with some upcoming timelines. So uh, excited about this, uh, you know, happening this fast. So uh, all I have for remainder for closing is uh, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas. Uh, and for our younger viewers, Santa is classified as an essential worker. So he's on target. So just be advised of that. And um, as I've been saying right along, everybody in the community, please continue to practice social distancing recommendations. The masks matter. And um, you know, if anybody is in need of a COVID test, uh, just please recall, we, you know, we do have a site now based in Hardwick. Um, we have that information up on the town's website. Um, and uh, thanks to our friends at um, Northern County Healthcare, they've been doing a lot to, uh, you know, with uh, uh, as um, uh, in support or in collaboration with the Vermont Department of Health to have this testing site available for our area. It is no cost. They do they do recommend you register in advance if you're trying to get a test. It's a nasal swab. It's not the more invasive test because I've had some questions about that myself. So uh, just uh, up on our website, we have the information. It's up on their websites at the Department of Health website. So um, just one final note, if you'll allow me, uh, you know, we had the, uh, you know, the good news of the vaccine rolling out in our country this week and around the world. And uh, my opinion is that's very good news. And um, I'd like to think we're on the, you know, we're over the hump and we've got a ways to go to get back to normal, but we've made some significant positive steps. This being said, as I said, it's important everybody keeps social distancing, practicing the masks, you know, doing the right thing, cleaning so we can help ourselves out. So it's been a crazy year and, um, you know, we're, we're moving forward and everybody keep doing that. So that's all I have. Great. Thanks, Sean. Does anybody on the board have questions for Sean? Kaylee. It's a really quick question, Sean, um, but for that recreation grant is just to understand for um, you mentioned that there would be um, also bike racks and things like that. Are those the in line with the recommendations of the Planning Commission, just so I understand? Yeah, they are. Okay, so, great. Um, actually, what's uh, uh, what's interesting is in the pedestrian and traffic safety task force work that came out from the summer. It was actually a lower number of um, bike racks. Uh, and we actually started count, counting up different locations around the area. And, um, you know, to include, and I know this project isn't set, but, you know, there's some discussions around the Overlook Park up in East Herdwick. 
so um, you know we're uh, we went out we actually got a, uh, with the finances somebody's got an open channel so they need to mute um, uh, what I was gonna say is this we actually have uh, with the grant we're gonna be getting uh, eight bike racks you know and we're going into it I think pedestrian traffic safety task force I think it was like four so we're like well wait a minute let's really start making sure we can take advantage of these spaces where we're going to see more bikers uh, in the area so we definitely were tuned into that as well as um, you know some other information and uh, Jeff we did a good job the... go ahead I think he said you need one at the depot, right? Yeah, and we, we've got one there and one at the townhouse. So, you know, we've really done a good job of trying to figure out where are these locations where people are going to be taking advantage of various community assets and riding their bike to get over to these locations. So we're, we're trying our best to be tuned into this. That's awesome. Congratulations, Sean. Oh, well, thanks to um, our new employees. Done a nice job just pulling together some info in short fashion. So it's good for all of us. Yeah, it's great. Uh, all right, so next is a road foreman report. I imagine, I know I know what Tom was doing this morning, but Tom, what else do you want to tell us? Well, not much. Uh, we still have one truck down. Uh, supposedly they finally got the parts, but supposedly this week somebody had COVID down at the place there, so they have no techs available right now to put our truck back together. So hopefully next week we'll get it back, but I'm not counting on it. Uh, the other thing is Todd's truck went down today. Uh, we finally got that back on the road probably, oh, I think it was somewhere around 3 o'clock this afternoon. Oh, um, well, yeah, it's been a fun day. Um, yeah. So that's why you probably saw me trying to buzz around town with a pickup still. Uh, but anyway, uh, we did manage to uh, get out there before we got, you know, the ground froze a little bit, uh, cover up some more of the potholes that the guys uh, did. Uh, they've also been uh, cutting a little bit of brush here, here and there. Uh, Mike and Ed went down into the pipe gallery down at the uh, pump house and got that all scraped and all repainted. Uh, the guys been touching up some of the uh, equipment and stuff with the, with the paint and stuff. Uh, besides that, I mean, a lot of guys have been taking some time off because, well, we're kind of in a down, down, down time right now. So, but anyways, so we got a couple of, uh, I think a water and sewer problem. We got to try to take, take care of hopefully for the weekend. And that's about it. All right. Sounds good. Does anybody have questions for Tom? I have a very specific question. Um, this is Kaylee. Um, and so just thinking about the uh, right in public where the rail trail crosses by um, I, also, I noticed the signs, the trail crossing signs, which I don't know if that was the town or um, I know it's kind of tricky right now because we were kind of waiting for the state to finish up the rail trail, even though we've done a lot to, to get it usable, which has been awesome. Um, right in East Hardwick, um, I've just noticed because I live right there, um, that the crossing um, right on Brickhouse Road is, there's a lot of um, traffic that goes through there. And it's usually pretty fast. Um, I know that there are the trail use signs. Um, I'm just wondering if we have it in our budget or if it's possible to put a trail crossing sign, um, especially when snowmobilers start using that more. I don't know whose jurisdiction it is. Um, I will say there's also an old handicap sign there in the, um, the house, the family that that was there for no longer lives in the household. I'm just wondering if we could put anything in that uh, in that spot. Uh, well, we can, but technically the trail is not open up through there yet. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, that would be up to you guys, whether or not you guys want to order signs for that or wait for the state to go through next year and do it all. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, there's just another angle on that. Um, I, I, I can double check with the Snow Machine Club about what I heard maybe a month and a half ago was they may have it. So it isn't necessarily groomed, but that section is open, you know, from where you're talking about, Kaylee, going into either direction. What I could do is check with the club to see about if, you know, if you guys are actually going with that approach, can the club just put something up? You know, what would they put up? 
Uh, it is this V trans jurisdiction to be clear. It's their jurisdiction. And I know it's kind of a tricky timing because we're it's being used a lot, but it's not open. Um, but there is there is that sign that could be taken down, so it might be e the the base is already there. I don't know if that would help, if that would help. Um, I also just and you know this, Sean, because you've been on the trail. There's a pretty major washout um, right past Pumpkin Lane, um, so I don't know if we need to just let ask they're going to put signs there for snowmobiles because it make it there's a um the trail narrows pretty significantly in that one spot they are aware of this this is why they have not uh, uh decided to groom so that's going to be uh something the uh local club would be responsible to just you know if they need to flag it sign it that's going to be their call okay great thank you Uh, any other questions about roads? I was going to say to Tom, it's uh, good news is you don't have 40 inches of snow like Southern Vermont. <laughs> well, if we did, we'd probably all just park the truck and go home anyways. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have one thing. Tom, last time you told us you were looking at uh, your research and option for a new truck. Um, any updates on that? Uh, no, not really. Uh, okay. I was looking over the specs a little bit more, and it's yeah. quite different than Pearly's truck. I mean, it's it's the uh, the wheelbase is longer on it, uh, and then I was looking. It's got a dip, different uh, spring setup on it, which we normally don't run. And there's quite a few other things that were on it too. So I'm gonna try to go over it with Sandy, uh, the uh, dealer there, and just find out how that would affect the truck and everything else. So. Okay, this is the one that that's already existing on somebody's lot, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and you're, if that doesn't work out, then you'll order one. Yes, correct. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. So next up is Harvard Police Department report. Um, do we? I don't see Aaron. Sean, do you? Uh... Sergeant Barber might be with us. Um, he was going to cover for Aaron, but, um, that open mic, I think was Sergeant Barber and the cruiser. Oh, wait, I just saw somebody on mute. Sergeant Barber, is that you? That is me. Can you hear hey, me? Hey, good evening. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll mute now. Can you okay. Uh, Aaron asked me to just read a couple things that we have going on. Um, the police department is continuing to observe the COVID restriction and safety protocols. Uh, in addition, the east end of our building, known as the Senior Center, uh, is closed again to the general public and seniors uh, for safety reasons during the pandemic. Uh, next up, Detective Leho has been familiarizing our new officers uh, with all of the area school safety protocols and uh, showing them the interior makeup of the buildings. Uh, that's both Hardwick and Greensboro. Uh, currently, we have, most importantly, an active investigation of uh, the shooting of a dog in Greensboro. Um, and we are consulting with the uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department uh, regarding this incident. And lastly, um, we've been conducting reviews of our cases over the past year and the officers have just completed uh, all of our state required training for the year. Um, each officer is required to complete a mandatory minimum of 30 hours of continuing education um, and then several classes that are uh, mandated by the police academy to retain their certification. All right. Well, that was quite a bit of information, quite quite concisely, thank you. You're welcome. Um, does anybody have questions? Any of the board members have questions for Darren while we have him? I'm seeing some shaking heads, nobody has anything. All right, thank you, Darren, appreciate it. All right, thank you, have a good night. Darren, thank thanks, you. have a safe shift. Thank you, sir. Yep. All right, um, next up we have a Hardwick Electric Department report and I think Mike Sullivan is with us. 
Um, Mike, do you want to give us a rundown of what's happening at, in the electric department world? Sure. So uh, I, I'll get to the email I just sent you all in a minute, to, but be aware I just sent you one. Um, so numbers, your take revenues are about Four percent, $23,000 over the budget. Uh, year to date expenses are almost 7% or $300,000 under budget. And that's primarily driven from what are you shaking your head about? Uh, uh, we're having a, we're, uh, you're breaking up, I think, or at least you are for me. Is that true for everyone? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me shut off my video. Actually, when you, okay. And when you speak directly at, when you're looking right at us, it seems to be a little better. Okay, is that better? Yeah. All right, I'll start over. Thank you. <laughs> Year to date revenues are about $23,000 over budget and expenses are 7% or $300,000 under budget. But that number is deceiving and was driven because of our postponing several uh, capital projects in February and March for the year because we were getting into all the unknowns of COVID yeah. and didn't really know what we would or wouldn't be able to do. So we put those off till next year. Uh, uh, if while I'm talking, if somebody could forward that email that I sent to Wiz, I don't think I had you on my list, Wiz. I got it, Mike. Um, purchase it. power year to date. Purchase power year to date is ninety six thousand dollars or four percent under budget, and our coverage ratio, which is the amount of power we purchase to satisfy all the customers' needs, is running at a hundred and three percent. So BEPS is doing a great job for us. Um, we just ran our 2020 inventory and on $380,000 spent, we were off by less than 1%. So that was a fantastic, uh, accounting year by the crew and the staff. Um, our VCAP monies, I don't know if any of you are aware with those about those, but VCAP was a program to help people with uh, arrearages on utility bills, gas, water, electric, et cetera. Oh, that's and, recent, uh, right? So we had, yeah, yeah. So we had um, $96,000 in the arrears attributable to COVID um, that was 60 and 90 days overdue. And we had kind of a campaign to inform ratepayers about this money through VCAP. We had it on the website. We actually made calls to all, all customers. Uh, we had a thing in the paper. I'm sure some of you saw that. And we actually uh, got $66,000 or 70% of the arrearages covered by that program. So very successful. Um, and you know, good use of money by our ratepayers. So that was fantastic. Um, Okay, I'm going to steer over to my chart I sent you, if I can find mine. So the res requirements, some of you may or may not be familiar with, but we have three levels of uh, renewable energy requirements on all utilities in Vermont. Uh, the first level of those are called uh, tier one credits, which uh, from 2017 through 2032, land each utility uh, with 75% of their energy needs being provided by renewable sources. The second level of those are distributed generation, where 1% of all our energy sales in 2017 has to increase to 10% by 2032. That, rec that uh, tier two is going to be satisfied almost entirely by the H11 project. So we're very much ahead of schedule and ahead of the curve on that one. 
And then the energy innovation projects, those are tier threes. And those are the hardest ones really because it's about utilities uh, trying to help people switch from fossil fuels to our electric product, um, which is not always an easy sell. But uh, so we have to go from 2% of our BTU equivalency of sales in 2017 up to 12% in 2032. And I know I'm boring you, but I wanted to give you that background before I went through the chart with you. So now if you look at the chart in the email that I sent you just a few minutes ago, um, some things that are going on here that are, that are working behind the scenes to get us in line with all these goals are um, the solar component of our resource mix. I have a note there that the H11 will increase this uh, to almost 10% of our mix. So that's going to be a huge kick. Uh, plus, it's additional uh, renewable energy credits in the state generation. Another block we've been using the last five years or so, uh, four years, is coming to an end, and we are replacing it uh, with some hydro energy. And we just replaced half of that contract with, with hydro at a 10% cost reduction. Uh, to what the nuclear contract was, which is fantastic. And we have the other half in the works with another provider, but that's still uh, under a confidentiality agreement. The, then down on the left, I have a note there that the hydro increased uh, by 4% last year. So we, sent, uh, we signed a new contract adding some hydro uh, out of Massachusetts to our portfolio. So there's a lot of stuff going on with our uh, purchase power needs, uh, targets, and meeting all the renewable standards. Just wanted to make you aware of that. You'll probably be hearing more from me and the commissioners as they join your meeting and discuss this stuff. Um, beyond those beauties, I had quite a bit of information in my manager's report last month um, that I provided to you all. And I wanted to throw that out and uh, make myself available here to clarify any of that data or take any questions about that report or take any questions on any topic you might have. Any topic? Sure, like I mean, a hardwick electric topic. Oh, I was gonna ask you about some quantum mechanics. Um, so no, can, I, yeah. <laughs> can I ask on your, on your chart that you emailed to us, is the goal generally to have, um, a certain percentage less than a hundred percent of your, um, power supply contracted? Like, are you trying to stay away from hitting a hundred percent of contracted need? So it's really, um, uh, it's literally an impossibility to hit 100% because you you don't know what people are going to use. You don't know what business is going to come into your service territory next month that you were unaware of. You don't know what business might be closing its doors and moving to New York. You know, there, there's variables in there. So the best we do and our target is to end up uh, each month somewhere between 95% coverage and 105% coverage. So right now for the year, we're at 103. So we're definitely within target. And what that means for the year is that we actually had accommodations for 3% more of the power than we needed. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we have to sell that back to the ISO, which yeah. is a great thing if the cost of power is high because we make money. And it's a poor thing if the cost of power is low because we lose money. But okay. the cost of power, our costs of power on our contracts has been running right around market. So it's almost a break even. But when you're looking at that chart, your goal is, isn't to get to like 80%. It, it is to get close to 100% for your contracts. Yeah, perfection okay. would be to nail it at 100% all the time, yes. My Haley, are you wanting to say something? 
Was Kaylee first? I wasn't really paying attention. After Wiz is fine. Okay. Um, I've wondered about this, but I don't think I've ever seen it before. And I'm sure that this is a topic that you could go on for great long hours about, but could you briefly explain the landfill gas um, entry on this chart? Yep, we have a contract uh, with an entity at a landfill uh, in Massachusetts. It's called, uh, I think it's the Fitchburg contract where they generate power from the gases out of the landfill, just like the Washington Electric Co-op facility does in Coventry, Vermont. And uh, we buy that energy from them at the uh, Vermont node and it comes into our system through the ISO New England. Kaylee. <laughs> Mike, I was wondering if there were any updates on where the state is with the Craftsbury matter. Um, well, the, the whole matter is in front of the Public Utility Commission. Uh, things were delayed because um, of some negotiations that were brewing, but uh, were not successful. So things are due to get back on schedule and in front of the board, which is basically uh, court, you know, that's the equivalent of court uh, in mid January. So hopefully, you know, by, by spring, the, the matter will be settled. And however the Great. board rules is fine by us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mike, in the beginning, I may have just not understood it entirely, but in the beginning you talked about um, the three different kind of levels of renewables and one of them was uh, um, incenting customers to move away from fossil fuels toward um, electric um, power, is that correct? That is correct. So would that, I mean, the things that come to mind are, um, moving like uh, space heating from burning fossil fuels to maybe a heat pump that's electrically powered. And maybe instead of a car that runs on gasoline, maybe a car that runs on electricity. Are those kind of the big areas that, that you would target? Those are targeted areas and we do have programs through the joint action at VEPSA for both of those. Um, the problem is if you get uh, 10 cars and 10 heat pumps, it really doesn't equate to a lot in satisfying the targets. So I'm going after more customers such as authentic log homes on Route 14. They run a big, noisy, old, stinky, inefficient diesel generator. And I'm trying to get them to get rid of that and tie to us. That project or projects like that have huge benefits for us and create large volumes of rec credits that we can use to satisfy that tier. So that one project would easily surpass what we would get out of 100 electric vehicles, for example. And do you have to? Does it have to be um, a, uh, something that's existing that switches from false? I'm just thinking of the yellow barn and, you know, it's not built yet, but it's going to be a fairly large user of energy. Um, does it, is it helpful? Yeah, so to if you, if you guys were, con if you guys were considering technology A, technology B and electricity from Hardwick Electric, and we could show that we incentivized you by contributing some dollars to your project or whatever. We helped you choose electric or those other over fossil fuels. Then that is a project that would definitely fall into the tier three and be beneficial. Okay, I think I got the gist of that, and I think that maybe we should follow up later because I think that's a good conversation to continue. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything for Mike? 
What were you replacing the diesel? Yeah, this is Doug from Lego Zap. What would you be replacing those diesel generators with? Our electricity, energy out of that residual mix chart that I showed. Okay, I don't have a, the chart, so I'll have to look at that. Yeah, it's on our website too, if, if you wanna just pop it up. Mike, is it okay if I forward it to Doug as well? Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. There we go. All right, thank you, Mike. Appreciate all the detail. You're welcome. Okay. Um, next is uh, item number one. We have um, Matt Krajewski here from our, our assessor um, to present some more errors and omissions requests. And I think these are generated or they are, they have occurred because of, I'm guessing, new information from the state about current use. That is correct. And it's guaranteed to be the last errors and omissions segment here because we can't do any after January 1st. So that's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, I'll be short with this. I'm just going to kind of give you the gist as you touched on. These are all current use matters. So these are all passed on to us by the state of Vermont as to uh, uh, basically reallocate taxable value. So none of the assessed values, the total real values are actually changing here. Um, so I'll just go quickly through. There are seven of them here. I believe you have them in front of you. Um, and certainly if you have any questions after I'm finished, I'll be happy to answer any. Um, the first one is North Hardwick Dairy, parcel 06009.00010. Um, the previous land use reduction was 340,700. Um, the new land use reduction as passed down by the department is 300,800. You can see certainly all of the taxable implications I put into this report. Um, the second parcel is gonna be Center Farm LLC, uh, parcel 06020.00000. Land use reduction, 113,300 uh, previous. New proposed is 62,200. Uh, Ivan Reno Life Estate is the third, parcel 06028.00000. Land use reduction previously was 18,200. Uh, the new proposed is zero. Uh, the fourth is Atticus Gillen, parcel 06040.00000. Land use reduction previously was $6,800. The new proposed is going to be zero. Uh, Reno Demers, uh, parcel 0605, uh, 054, excuse me, .00010. Previous reduction, 14,600. Uh, new proposed is 20,900. Uh, David M. Ring Revocable Living Trust, one parcel 10032.000, excuse me, 00. Previous reduction was 86,100. The new proposed is 158,000. And finally, a parcel owned by Harry B. Bassett. Uh, parcels 10067.00000. The previous land, redu land use reduction was 51,400 and the new proposed is 52,600. So if you have any specific questions for me there, I know I kind of went fast through this, but I promise Sean I'd be brief with this one. Anybody have any questions, Wiz? I don't understand the land use what this all thing, what it, this is all about. So I can, uh, the, the first three of them uh, in particular, just to give you a little bit of detail, it has to do with the owners of the property being notified several times by the current use department to recertify their agricultural land. And uh, for whatever reason, they did not do this. So the current use department basically sends us a new download and basically instructs us to remove their agricultural land from the program. Um, so I'm gonna, a, can I jump in a second, Matt? Sure. Wiz, was your question generally about the current use program and how that, yeah. So I think just generally, I'll try to take a step to that. Um, so Vermont has a program where if you, they call it, it's colloquially known as 
current use, but it's, uh, I can't remember the formal name, but um, it's a program where in, in order to incent people to keep their land in forest or agriculture and not develop it into buildings, um, if you keep it in that current or historical use, you can get a break on your taxes by enrolling in this program. By enrolling in the program, you also allow the state to have a lien um, on your property recorded in the town records. So it gives you a break. But from the town point of view, it, it's complicated because the, the taxpayer now pays a lower tax, but the state makes a payment, a lump sum payment back to the town to make us whole so that we don't, we aren't out the tax revenue if the state reimburses us. It's, I don't, did it, Matt, is that fairly close? Oh, yeah. To, Okay. Yep, that's that's spot on right there. Yeah, I'm, I apologize to for getting into the specifics there of the individual ones there. If that wasn't your question. One thing I might add is that in order to be in that, my understanding is that you have to have, at least for um, forestry, and we have to have a current use plan. Is that right? That's so correct. You have to yep. The state periodically. Yep. And they can certainly transfer if like a property is sold, it could transfer to the next person. They could get it recertified. But yeah, you do need to have a plan in place, and a forester usually generates that. So there are seven total. The first three are reducing and the remaining four are adding. Is that correct? So it kind of depends on how you look at it. It, it reduces the current use impact on the first three. It's going to yield a higher tax bill in all three of those cases. The last three of them, um, I believe, are uh, actually working in the favor of the property owners there. So um, I think in one, like one case as an example is the David Ring parcel that I referenced there. Um, they had originally told us that he didn't file his paperwork in time. And then they had said they had endured such a backlog here in, during COVID um, that they did have his filing. So that, that one certainly works in his favor. He's allotted that agriculture land that he has certified. But the net result to the town should be a wash, right? That's correct. Yeah, oh. there's a something kind of referred to as like a sure up time at the end of the year. It needs to be done before December. Um, so in terms of the impact to your your overall grand list and just what you collect, it's it, it shouldn't affect that. Is this who we're collecting it from? Correct. Yeah, it's more the the allocation of it. Yep. The big deal for the landowner. It's not as big. You're looking for a motion to, uh, um, how would I word it, approve these uh, seven errors and emissions. emissions as presented? Correct. Yeah. So just because you have a select board meeting here before January 1st, the state technically says we have to handle this as an error and omission and I have to present it to you. You formally have to accept it. So, so moved. Second. All right. So we have a a motion from Sherry, a second from Kaylee. Any other questions from the board here? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I think that was everyone, right? Yeah, so that was unanimous. Everybody is an aye and the motion passes. And thank you, Matt, for bringing it to us. All right, well, thank you for having me and happy holidays to everybody. Same to you. I, oh, I have Sherry. one thing before Matt takes off because I'm not sure where this fits into the whole thing, but um, I was I've realized today that um, I never received my uh, homestead um, allocation or whatever that and after calling the state finding out that my electronic tax um, submission on February 17th, the filing that was never received. Um, so a long, uh, a, a couple hours later, um, you know, I've talked to quite a few people. A lot of people <laughs> should check their, um, their property tax bill because I believe that this was, there was something that went very wrong with the state because I, my tax guy said he's had multiple people check with him because they, they didn't receive electronic filings um, and so they didn't submit those letters that, you know, say how much is going to be deducted from your property tax bill based on your homestead status. You know, I kept waiting for it to happen. I thought that something 
was going on because of COVID. And I think something really was. Um, but I just thought I'd just throw it out there. I think I'll try to, you know, put something on Front Porch Forum. I mean, maybe other people are better about really checking this stuff. <laughs> I thought I was checking it and I was asking Alberta what was going on and she was telling me that things are, weren't happening as fast and then all of a sudden, you know, life got busy and I stopped checking and after October 15th, you have to work it out with the state directly. It's no longer um, part of the, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's messed up and I think okay, so, a lot so happens. This so this is a public service announcement to people yeah. to check their Take tax look bill and make sure that your residential your homestead status is correct okay yeah fair enough all right well thank you I, i'll mention this i mean i said i was going to keep it brief I, I it's a common theme i've certainly seen that a lot of things seem to be backlogged whether it's current use whether it's homesteads i'm um, on our web page uh on the through the town website the listers page uh, we do have a link on there that's leading people to the homestead page. We really want to try to be proactive with people filing if they are residents. So we'll uh, yeah. we'll certainly continue to do that as to to push people in that direction. Okay. Thank you all. Good. Thanks, man. Have Thanks, a good night. Matt. You too. Thanks. Merry Christmas. Um, uh, so next up, we have Alberta here to talk to us about. Um, town meeting in during a pandemic and how we're going to handle that and what the state legislature is doing to try to help us, I think. Right, Alberta? That is correct. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Okay. I'm leaving my camera off because my internet is being very fickle and it keeps telling me that it's going to get rid of me. So <laughs> I'm hoping it, I can at least get through this without camera. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if I lose you, I'll call in. <laughs> okay. So I will keep this very quick because I really don't have a lot of information to give at this time, but I wanted to give you what little bit that I, that I have in my hands. Um, so under the, current directive of the governor, um, groups can, can be no larger than 75 people. And because town meeting, we average between 125 and 150, we're not going to be able to, at this time, handle town meeting the way that we normally would. Um, also, in addition to that, I've already kind of talked with the, the Hardwick Elementary School, which has said they're not allowing public access um, to large groups like that. So that's already kind of limiting where we would be able to go for the meeting if we were going to try for town meeting because I would we would need to, to have a place where, um, you know, 75 people, if we decided to go with a public meeting, could socially distance. Um, so that would all be things that we would have to consider in that, in that process. Um, the, in the spring of 2020, the legislature enacted um, Act 162. And basically that says that any legislative body um, in the town can vote for one year only to switch their meeting um, from um, a floor vote to an Australian ballot format if they so choose. Um, the reason for that being that in the spring, there were a lot of like revotes, recounts of things, and um, suddenly COVID hit and we were all shut down and you couldn't have public meetings anyway. So that is one thing that we should be kind of considering in the process as you're, you guys are going through is that we do have an option of going to a, an Australian ballot um, forum for one year um, under the Act 162. Um, that being said, if we were going to go to an Australian ballot forum, um, we would need probably to move forward with using the um, vote tabulator machine because we'd be looking at more like 50 items that needed to be counted as opposed to six or seven. Um, let's see. The legislature is apparently going to be debating on their first week back whether or not they're willing to allow towns to postpone town meeting at all. Um, 
I guess it could be as little as a couple three weeks to get your Australian ballot format in order to as much as um, you know a couple of months if towns are adamant that they're going to want to do it as a public forum as opposed to an Australian ballot. Um, so let's see. Um, so that's pretty much all I've got for tonight. I did talk, um, or I'm sorry, Tanya did update the town website and I threw something out on Front Porch Forum, just explaining the process this time around for um, if you wanna run for, for public office, um, you know, that we're not doing petitions this year. So there's a form that you will need to fill out and resubmit to the town um, no later than the 20, I think it was the 25th of January. Um, we currently have, three select board seats, one Hazen School Director, and three Orleans Southwest um, district seats that will all be available to be run for for town meeting. Um, and then other than I will be watching everything on email and um, available from Secretary of State and VLCT, you know, before our next meeting in January, hopefully we'll have some more information. Any questions? That, that date's correct, Alberta. The 25th is what's on the website now. Thank so you, Act, 160, Act 162, um, that extends into, I guess I didn't understand that previously. So that extends into um, 2021. So that we already have the ability to go to Australian ballot. Yes, yes. Act 162 was for a full year. I believe it was voted in for a full year and it wasn't voted in until sometime in April of last year. Was my understanding. Okay. okay. I can double check that, Eric, but that was the way that I had previously understood that to be. That Act 162 no, would allow our towns to do that this year, in this year. Right. Okay. And put everything on Australian ballot. And yes, anything that you would okay. normally do as a voice vote from the floor, you would have yeah. the option to put on. Okay. Alberta. I can get, double check that before our next meeting, but. No, you're probably right. I'm probably just confused. Alberta, um, can you program the reader to handle a ballot that size? Yes. With enough money, you can program it to do anything you want to do <laughs> no i'm just kidding um yes they they do i mean they do make it capable to do that many that many things it probably would require more than one ballot but it can be set up to do that many articles some of the bigger towns like burlington they do everything that way anyway how much money are we talking about I, I don't know the answer to that question yet. I've sent the email. I don't have a solid answer back on that one yet. So that will be something we'd have to discuss. It may be way too much, but it's worth at least reaching out to the company to find out. Do you have a ballpark? Um, I'm guessing somewhere in the vicinity of 3,000. So... so 33,000 or 3,000? Around 3,000. Oh, good. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I wouldn't even, yeah, I wouldn't even come to you guys and say 33. The no. line. Yeah, there was a stutter in the line. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we have to, can you remind us of the dates that we need to hit. So we need to have our warning out a certain interval before town meeting, correct? Our warning needs to be signed and posted 30 days before town meeting. So oh, we're it's only looking 30? at if, if everything's yeah, 30 days. It's more, it used to be, it's even not more than that now, but it's more for bond, but it, it, that actually has changed now. Bonds are only 30 days also. Just if I can interrupt, there's one other factor there. But we yes, do we, have to have a little more time to have our town report ready to be in people's hands. That is the warning though, isn't it? No, my point is this. Yeah, um, the warning, you, the if, first date. The... Go ahead, Alberta. No, I'm sorry, Sean, you go ahead. 
all I was pointing out is, um, yeah, the warning has to be out 30 days, but um, uh, in people's hands at the 30 day mark, if we're distributing a town report, we have to have that out prior to that 30 day timeline. We got to get it to the printers, got to get it ready to go. That is true as far as getting it to the printers. I, I don't I don't have in front of me what Casey's recent email timeline. I know she's January been in contact 29th. with the with our printer. It's oh, January thank 29th. You, Casey. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. So but now is that Casey, is that when everything has to be in the hands of the printer to start print to start? Printing That's, the town report? They have to have the PDF and then they'll have a proof back to us within, I think, think two or three business days. And then we have 24 hours to approve the proof. So I think the proof is approved by us by February 4th. And we have to have the mailing labels to them too, something like that. So, yeah. I'm missing so, something. I'm missing something. That's that that's not that's not 30 days. What am I missing? Well, the the 30 days is the warning, Sean. We have to have signed the warrant at, at the 30 day mark. We have to have signed the warning, and I have to have it posted in five places. Okay, not in the report. That's, that's, that's where I'm uh, getting mixed they up. Have Sorry. To receive the report like the report. 10 days before the meeting or something. Okay, like understood. That, I think, yeah. Right. Yeah. But prep. So. But practically, so our first opportunity to sign the our first opportunity to sign the warning would be would be the Thursday, January twenty first. That would be the first time you could sign it, and I believe we have seven or eight days, seven or ten days after that 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 is the window of when we need to get it signed so that I can get it posted by February second. And and this is particularly, this is kind of the salient point, right? Because when that warning goes up, it, at that point, we it either needs to say, look, we're gonna meet and this is the date, or it needs to say, we're not gonna meet and you're gonna mail in a ballot and we're gonna send it to you or something like that, right? That is correct, yes. Yep, the, the warning has to specifically state how we are voting this year, in person or by Australian ballot. And if we're voting by Australian ballot, and I mean, it just feels like there, there's a bunch of things that are gonna to need to fall into place, right? So if we make that decision, then we need to have ballots printed. We need to figure out if we're gonna be able to reprogram the machine so that we have machine readable ballots and we're gonna um, figure out how we're gonna get the ballots to people because at least, in my mind, it seems like it would be a worthwhile effort to try to send them to people and have, you know, have them mail them back to the town clerk. I don't know. Right. So, yes, agreed. The, so the only thing that could potentially push the timeline out to give us more space, I think, is if the legislature does indeed give select boards or towns, the select the municipal bodies of towns to uh, the ability to change the date of town meeting just this once. If we were able to push out the date, then we could, you know, that would give us a little more room, breathing room, right? Because then if we push it out to say um, the 1st of April or something, then, then we don't have to have the warning out till 30 days before that. It gives us a little more room to get everything straightened away. That is true. Yep, it prepares that a little better. Alberta, if, if we go with mail-in ballots, have you heard anything about any money that the state might be willing to help us pay for the cost of, of mail-in ballots, mailing out, mailing back? That's that looks like a fairly expensive process. So I haven't heard of anything yet, Wiz. I, I'm guessing that that's all part of what the legislature is supposed to be discussing and debating that first week that they're back in session, um, which is cutting it very close in my opinion. But um, I do know that just in passing, 
Jim Condos has made a couple of comments where that he would like to see them give funding that could be passed on to the towns to assist in that process because it is going to be necessary this year. But there's nothing yet, um, and I have not heard specifically of any like COVID related funds that they're going to try and designate to that process. So unfortunately, no, I don't have anything yet. I didn't um, have a chance to check. We would probably be able to I didn't have a chance to check the news today, but I know the stimulus discussions now at the federal level, they are now talking about um, additional support to uh, local and state and municipalities, but I just have no idea, you know, where that went. That would be for the, you know, from Jan 1 on. So there might be, you know, that, that just, that would maybe trickle down. I just, I don't know any more than that, but I know they were talking about it at the federal level. It's just that it, uh, just so everybody is aware, it's just going to end up being kind of a tight time frame to make it make decisions and get our ducks in a row because the earliest the legislature would possibly take any action would be something like the end of the second week of January. And, you know, we're saying that we need to by, you know, two weeks after that is when we need to be mailing out our our town report and warning the meeting so. Uh, Alberta, correct me if I'm wrong, Just but as, I, quick... as I understand it, um, it, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out would there be a change on the town meeting date, but as I understand it, we're holding to our dates for anybody that is interested in running for office and or any, um, you know, uh, special appropriations request, we are keeping to our traditional timelines on those items. So do I have that correct? That is correct, Sean. Yes, we we are sticking with those dates, especially right now, because I mean, it, we could have passed those dates by the time that the legislature has made decisions. So yes, the dates are still solid. And with Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, just to give you a quick number, um, based on our current checklist, we'd be looking at somewhere around $3,500 probably to mail ballots to everyone and get them mailed back. And that's not, that's not trivial. Right. No, no, not at all. Nope, it would be, yeah. It is, it, yeah, it is not inexpensive to have to do that process. I thought I heard you say that, that the legislature had given select boards an opportunity to change town meeting date just this once, or was that just something that was under discussion? That is going to be under discussion. The only thing that I know of that they gave permission for is for um, legislative bodies to go from public meeting to Australian ballot for one year. Um, but the um, the moving of town meeting, the potential moving of town meeting, that is, a, that is something that they're going to be taking up when they get back in session. Alberta, do you, do you feel like you need the extra time if we were to consider um, postponing town meeting or things just um, went ahead now, would you have time to, to, to do all this new ballot stuff? I am pushing forward as if we're not going to change it in any way, Lucian. Um, but if we could even give it two extra weeks, that would be, especially when you're dealing with that massive amount of mailing, I think that that would be incredibly helpful in the process. Um, but, you know, I'm pushing forward as if it's going to happen on March 2nd you know, with that possibility out there that maybe we will have a little wiggle room at the other end. Okay, that makes sense. But For town just, report purposes, I would need to know kind of as soon as possible if we are gonna move in the direction of moving things out because we've made an agreement with them on these dates of getting them the proof and everything by January 29th. So if that's going to be moved out, I would need to know so that I could renegotiate with that those dates as soon as possible. We, but we won't know if we have the uh, legal authority to change the date until probably sometime around January 15th. Mm. Okay. 
because we just don't <laughs> currently we don't have that authority. As far as printing those, I mean, even if they're printed a little early, that would, earlier than they have to be, that would be fine, right? The town report. It's just that, that we need to know what we're doing by the time it gets sent off to the printer. Right, but the warning is needed for the report. That's so that has to be finalized. So the warning would say whether we're doing it by Australian ballot or meeting or whatever it would outline how the meeting's going to go, and that's in the report. But right, so are you ready just... for my crazy idea yet? <laughs> All right. Whatever you got, Cherry. <laughs> well, if we were, were, weren't we looking into do, doing some, making some investments in technology for the upstairs meeting room, uh, video screens, et cetera? And if that were the case, um, what if we had a town meeting on the regular day, the traditional day, and we um, did something where we let 70 people, there's five of us plus Alberta, whatever, whatever. So 70 people can make a, a reservation to attend town meeting in person. And then, at, you know, at a, like a, a first come first serve reservation. And then the rest of the people could call in. And so we would televise we, it live. Do we, have, do we have a place where we can have 70 people be six feet apart? I think we do. Can you guess where that might be? I can guess what you're thinking of. I just didn't know. I that don't that know. Was... It's just an idea. I just, yeah. you know, but if we're going to spend a, uh, thousands of dollars on ballots and reprogramming and uh, for a one time thing, maybe we could get creative and actually invest that money in stuff that we're going to then further use you know, the technology, et cetera. Just a thought. My response to that, my first gut reaction is that when we were meeting in person as a select board and we had some people in person and some people either on the phone or online, that was- Problematic. That was, yeah, that was like the worst of all worlds. I don't know. I mean, you know, the townhouse has a live feed and we don't have any sports that are going to interfere with it. So couldn't 70 people be six feet apart and we could be, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But then the voting thing is still a problem. So I don't know. It, it, it maybe it's just crazy. I don't, yeah, never and, mind. And I, I don't know that I want to be there with 75 other right. people personally. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So never I mean, mind. Sorry. <laughs> I just, you know, these ideas come to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose another. Well, And I was just going to say, Sherry, that's an idea that I've heard on the news being thrown around by several towns, um, huh. that the possibility of doing that. Um, ah, I'm not as crazy as you thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will say, though, those are much smaller towns where they only have maybe 30 people at town meeting as opposed to 150 yeah. usually. But yeah, no, you're not crazy. That's been thrown around. So. I also heard that other towns were, were talking about postponing it far enough out that they thought they could do it outside, but apparently there's some other deadlines that that bumped up against and can cause problems. Uh, yeah, like their fiscal year starts, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. um, starts July 1 and, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, it starts getting, yeah. It sounds like we have a similar situation where the legislature needs to stay in and make this decision before taking a break. Like, can't they, you know? Well, they they were they only meet starting in they meet kind of January to April. Hmm. So it's not like, I mean, they're they're just not in session. Right. So they'll take it up. I mean information out there is that they're they're gonna there are folks who are very intent on taking this up first thing as a single issue bill and not add anything to it so that it can pass mm -hmm. um but still even at that speed you have to get it through both the house and the, the senate and you know the governor has to sign it and like top at going at top speed 
Um, the date that were, I believe the date that sticks in my mind is the end of the second week of January would be the earliest they could pass something. Alberta, does that sound right? Yes, that does, Eric. That sounded like the date that they were throwing around in that um, thing that I watched the other day. Yes. I think I forwarded that to everybody as if, you know, it's only two and a half hours of watching some people meet on Zoom. So, <laughs> you know, when but you our, get... um, our town report is doesn't change. So as far as printing that part. It does in that only the, the agenda, no? Yes, the, the agenda page, which is kind of the, which is the warning. And it says, you know, you're going to meet at this time in this place. And that's how we're, you know, uh, first thing is to elect a moderator and all that. So that would be different. What if we modify our town report and that, that, and that part becomes a separate mailing? The that in a letter size, you know, number 10 envelope. And then all the rest of the bulk of our town report we can do without that right yeah that was my thought too sherry or we could even print it out as a separate piece of paper and put it into the town report when we know it's like a colorful document we could do both mm -hmm. this is a bulk mail issue though we don't touch it it comes from the printers so i don't know how yeah, those logistics would work yeah. So it would have to just be a thing where we just omit that part, those pages from the report, and then the rest of it, the descriptions, the budget, all that stuff is in the report. And that could go out on schedule. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of the warning being sent out as an individual document, you know, just in a regular postage letter. Yeah which is another mailing. But it would seems like seems like it would be less expensive. I mean, Casey would probably know better than any of us, but it seems like it would be less expensive to move forward with the, the bulk of the town report. That mailing could be that. And then we would have to potentially add another mailing and maybe that mailing could be included with the ballots if it turns out to be a ballot mailing, you know? Yeah. But you get the warning and and the ballot in the same mailing. Sure, that's mm -hmm. yeah, definitely bears thinking about. I mean, right? We have to consider it's all new, so consider different ways we could do it. Could we ask the printer if there's if there's an option to include a single page, like in the booklet, and what the cost would be? Oh, yeah, I mean, I could check with them um, on that, I guess, yeah. Yeah, so we have a bunch of different ideas, but I think, can we, um, it's my feeling anyway, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what the feelings of the rest of the board are, but it's my feeling that we should not attempt an in-person town meeting in uh, March. Most of the people who come to town meeting are retired. Um, you know, that's a that's a dangerous age group to pull together in a large meeting. I mean, the other possibility is if you uh, if you have faith that the vaccine rollout is going to be smooth and fast, and people are going to be vaccinated before, say, March. Uh, <laughs> April, May, <laughs> Lucian shaking his head already. And we'll have like, everybody will be immune and all things will be groovy by like May. Yeah. I the don't... last and, thing I... I heard before I came upstairs to my office, um, I, don't rem I don't know what was on, was that we know that this vaccine prevents people from getting ill. We don't know whether the vaccine prevents them from spreading it if they do come in contact with it. The point being that you could take it in, the vaccine will protect you from its attacking you, but we don't know whether the vaccine will keep that, keep you from spreading it. Fun fact. So in postponing the meeting creates chaos with our select board terms, with uh, everything. So 
I think um, the better plan is to assume that we're going to have an Australian ballot meeting. And just figure out how that can happen. Figure out how it can happen and figure out how um, we can separate the mailings or maybe if need be so that we can adjust the warning possibly is or, if we need to. Or maybe if we know already that we're heading toward Australian ballot, maybe we just start moving in that direction and maybe it can all happen on the normal schedule. I don't know. So one time thing, one time, one yeah. time. It's just one time, but it's gonna, it's, mm -hmm. It's going to be not simple to pull off. Mm -mm. It's going to be different. Yep. And it's going to cost money. <laughs> Kaylee. I just have a question for Casey in Alberta, or I guess for anybody in the town offices. Is it better if we, as Eric's saying, if we make kind of the decision with more time, or is there leeway to wait until January? What's kind of what would be ideal for your work? Um, well, quite honestly, Kaylee, until the, I mean, we're stuck at March 2nd right now with until the legislature goes back in and makes a decision anyways. So in all honesty, it, it's, I'm working toward doing it on March 2nd anyway. Um, so if we, we just decide that's what we're gonna stay with, then that's what we're gonna stay with. But it, I think maybe the gist of Kaylee's question, Alberta, was like, if the board is saying, like, is it helpful if the board saying, yeah, we want to do this by Australian ballot and we know that now, does that help? Or yes, yes, that's, yes, that's incredibly helpful um, because that that gives me more direction on, okay, this is the path we need to take and these are the changes we need to make. I had uh, two calls this week already about this, and I just had to say to them, to the citizens, well, we're, we're not quite sure yet. And I think it's, um, that's something folks don't want to hear for the next month. And we're not quite sure yet. <laughs> so you know, if we have the capability to pin down some portions of this, I think it helps us logistically, but um, I don't know, that's just my thought. Okay, you want a motion? Kayla gave, you the, thumb, Kayla gave you the thumbs up. I it, I would love to I, I would love a motion. I would love it to have the to cite the Act 162, wherever that is in statute. I don't have that in front of me. I don't either, but listen, I honestly don't I honestly don't think you need to make a motion tonight. I think you just need to give me the directive and I'm gonna move forward with it and We'll make it. You could make a motion more specifically, Excellent. either January, first January or second January meeting. However, you want to do it, but you're All good. Right. You guys have given me the direction you want to go in, and I think we're fine. Beautiful. I think. I think with it seems like the board generally agrees that we want to move toward an Australian ballot, not in person, and whatever. However, whatever we need to do to make that happen, if it turns out that we need to, yeah, whatever we need to do. If, if you need to make a motion, we'll make it at the next meeting, but I'll do a little more follow up and make sure that I know exactly what you need to say. So perfect. Okay. Great. Thanks, Alberta. That's, that's helpful. Sure. All right. I'm going to move us to item three. I'm going to, uh, item three was a conservation commission, but Rachel Kane addressed us during the um, communication from the audience. So Unless somebody else wants to say something about um, Conservation Commission, we're going to move on to item four. Hearing nothing, moving on to item four. Casey is uh, has another draft budget, um, and she got a, a bunch of updated figures for us that she sent in email form. Yes. Okay. So um, we got our bills for VLCT insurance for 2021, um, their calendar year bills, but that helps us to um, budget for 2022 because it covers at least the first half of it. So it gives us a good idea of what to expect. AC, um, you yeah. gotta scroll one column to the left. We can't see uh, column A. Okay. 
the, the labels. Yep. All right. Um, so At least I anyway, can. There we go. so I've I've plugged in the new update insurance figures kind of in all the categories across the board. Um, our passive and workers comp saw decreases um, based on experience and there's contribution credits we get from over the years because it's kind of it's a shared pool. So we did see some decreases there, which was nice. Um, unemployment, as I mentioned, did see about a 30% increase because again, that's a pool of insurance. However, um, even though it's 30%, because the amounts were so small to begin with, we're really not talking about a lot of dollars there. I mean, literally maybe a thousand dollars overall. So it's it's pretty nominal, maybe even less. And then the other factor is so um, so once I made those adjustments in police and from the last adjustments we made, the police department budget has gone down. Our original draft was about 1,008,000. Right now we're at 983. Um, of course, due to that, um, that also is reflected in our revenue um, because we can anticipate the Greensboro police contract being a percentage of the police budget. So if we factor that in, it does decrease the revenue. Um, in addition to that, it's gonna be the final year and not even a full year of the COPS grant. And as I explained, we're not gonna have as much of reimbursement as we have um, current for the first year and a half of it. So that will be significantly less revenue in that category. So those are the two driving factors in the revenue reduction. Um, so as you can see right here, the um, expenses are only going up 1.5, but our, our revenue is going down three and a half with those two driving factors. Um, so this is where it stands right now. Casey, on the police department, since you learned more about the COPS grant, did the police um, payroll need to go back up? I have adjusted, no, I, I've adjusted. These figures are with the new information that I have, yeah. So I, um, I did, because most of that's going to be down here in um, COPS, like, because that's uh, our match portion. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, but as you can see, like, so workers comp, um, once I got the actual figures, that was a pretty significant decrease. Um, so, yeah. And... I know Lucian's asked some questions about overtime. Um, I have looked at the calculations for that. Um, and so what you, like I have a formula where you take the average overtime rate and then you take um, like the vacation hours, the personal hours, the six hours, the six hours, excuse me, um, and calculate out like, you know, you would need overtime coverage to cover those shifts. And so that's how that figure is derived. Um, I have taken a look at some historical data on that, um, which we can discuss. Um, so as you can see, fiscal year 20 was around, was right about 75,000. Um, I looked back at 17, 18 and 19 um, for that data. Cause I know um, Lucian was really wondering, you know, if, if that's a, a good figure. And like I said, that is formula based, but I did look back at historical numbers and let me just um, pull that up as, um, I just wanna, so we had fiscal year 17 was 53,000. 18 was 47,000, 19 was 48,000, then it jumped up to 75. And for our current fiscal year, we are budgeting 60,000. And year to date, we are at 27. So we're kind of on pace with that. So that's something to be considered. So even though I have like a guide where you take the average overtime, you, if you look historically, that's something you could consider. Um, and, but if the police department, if this goes down, revenue goes down as well. So it's not helping, um, the overall numbers, I guess, in the end, but, 
Um, well, we obviously it, want it, realistic. We want it to be realistic. So, I don't, yeah, I don't think that we should be too worried about if we lower something in the police budget that it will we'll lower the revenue because you'll you'll still end up with a seventy five percent of the dollar savings, right, or seventy six. So is that something think, you want you want to look at? Do you want me to plug in a different no. number there and see what it looks like? I, I don't necessarily because I yeah. feel, but I don't know what others feel. Yeah, I was I was just wondering, my question was that it seems like if, I mean, I think somebody else already said this at another meeting that if we have, if we're having more, um, if we have more officers than, than we had in previous years because we're fully staffed now, it seems like the overtime should be going down rather than bumping up the last few years. And so I guess right. it's still a part I'm still not clear about why that yeah. is. Yeah, so that was, I, I think I had that same question too, Lucian, last uh, one of the times recently. And I think the reason is because, um, because all the off, even if we're fully staffed, all the office, there are still shifts that become open when officers are on vacation. And the way the contracts are written, um the officers our current officers have the they get the right of first refusal to fill those shifts at an overtime rate before um, Aaron can offer them to a part-time officer so there's like a built-in uh amount of overtime kind of or or you can assume that there's a fair amount of overtime if you assume that most of the, that some of a lot of the officers are going to want to get that overtime work that's going to be offered to them before it's offered to a part-time officer, which would be cheaper for the town. And if each of the officers is required to do 30 hours of continuing education every year, that's going to create a lot of gaps. Well, it's, yeah, it's that and yes. their vacation and sick time and all that. Yep. Correct. Right, but if we have more officers on who are working more hours, then uh, like we still have 24 hours in the day that we've always mm -hmm. had. So, there, so the hours that are being covered must be going up. There must be more officer hours per year being worked. If we have if we have if we have another officer, we have one more officer than we had last year. So that adds 40 more hours in theory per week. Um, right on that, and then if we're doing the same amount of overtime, that means that we're getting 40 more hours per week of 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 coverage basically of one one officer than we did last year if the overtime is the same is that right yeah i mean i think that that is maybe somebody else can speak to this but i think that that is kind of the case lucian because i think that there are i think one of the chain uh, somebody maybe can use to correct me on this but i think when aaron first proposed adding another police officer the idea was that that he was going to restructure the officers such that there was going to be a dedicated detective and a um, sergeant and I, I, there was like a reordering of stuff and so it is yeah maybe it is the case that there's somebody else there's I mean there is definitely another full time position so maybe yes I think that's correct it would have been before I started here but. Um, when the detective position was created, that was maybe three or four years ago. So I, that sounds right, what you're saying. So then I think, though, that Lucian, that maybe the point is that that new position, that like that detective position, isn't the expectation within the department is not that that person will pick up a shift on the road when somebody's out on vacation. You know, they won't be out writing tickets and stuff they'll still be doing their detective work, I think. Right, and that makes sense. But the detective thing happened a few years ago, in my memory of it. Yep. There's been a couple of years where we didn't have as much staff. So so we're adding hours that we didn't have last year, which is fine. I'm just, I, I, I think I yeah. understand what it means. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm explaining it well, because I don't think I fully understand it either. So <laughs> I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but
but I know there has historically been this interplay between part-time officers and and the overtime and needing to cover the shifts. When we were understaffed, we had more part-time officer utilization, which wasn't wasn't always a bad thing for the budget. Um, Casey, I also have a question about like last time we had a discussion about in the police department um, salaries that it was the, I think the base salaries were padded, you had said to, so that we didn't have a, we didn't have as much of a bump when the cops grant ran out. Is that still the case? Yeah. Or? Yes, but I did it even, I had taken another $10,000 away from that last meeting. Yep. Um, so I already did that, like I already took some out, yeah. But there's still padding in there or there's not? There is just not as much. So not how much? much? There, we, there was 30 in there and we made it down to 20, I believe, if that memory serves me correctly. And then, um, but the bump, we're only getting, I'm just trying to compare that to the top, the COPS grant revenue. So this year in this budget that we're working on, the COPS grant revenue is about 13,000. Is that right? Yes, 13,6, yeah. So is my thinking correct that then the following year, that's going to be that revenue goes away. And so Correct. we need to have more. Um, we're going to need to have $13,000 more in payroll because we didn't. And then I guess. Well, so, so the expense will just shift right from cops up into base. Because there'll yes. be no cops. Yeah, there'll be no cops expense down down here this will be zero but it'll be built into this just the regular salaries so so then if that's the case and we're just trying to insulate ourselves against a bump next year and we know that bump is thirteen thousand dollars why would we need twenty thousand dollars of padding Uh, no, it that uh, that doesn't sound right to me. So okay. it's going to be the full. It's going to be the full salary, and we won't be getting any revenue. So, but this year, aren't we paying the full salary minus thirteen thousand? Right, because we we get a twenty five. We'll get a twenty five percent reimbursement. Yes, in this budget. S so the net increase to our budget next year is 13,000, isn't it? Roughly. I mean, I know that there's a cop, there's like going to be a 3% increase on the salary of the person and whatever, but you know what, right, you know I'm, what I'm saying? I'm just going to stop the share for a sec because I need to go to a different, yeah, I just want to go to a different screen where I have calculations that have information on them that I just like names and stuff. So I just need to go somewhere else for a minute. So the figure that I have in there actually is, it's everybody less 25,000 is what we have, that uh, was what I have for like built in there because we're gonna end up taking on all the salary. So I only subtracted 25,000 of it. That's where the figure comes from. I'm confused. So you add up all the base salaries and then subtract to 25,000 um, as a could like to build because we're going to have the whole salary in there next year. So I only subtracted part of it. I totally don't. You've lost me. Am I the only one to, is there other people understanding? Okay. Can you, 
um, so say so the if, can you show, if we can had you show no us on our budget grant. can you show us on our budget spreadsheet again yeah just a second So you add up all the salaries as if there's no COPS grant. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a, well, let's see. It actually came out to five, 520 something. Um, okay. And then because we want to build that in for next year, not do it all at once, because it won't be really till 23 that it's gone. I just subtracted 25,000 from it. I don't want to subtract the whole amount of the salary is what I'm saying. So I only subtracted a portion of it. I'm, I'm still sorry, I, I am still lost. So you at this so cell D eight is the sum of all the base salaries minus 25,000? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Cell so, so DA. And then what, and that all base salaries includes the SIU officer or not? Well, there's nothing for SIU anymore. There isn't any SIU down here anymore. Are you thinking there isn't anything here? Oh, there's nothing there. No. Oh, sorry, not SIU, COPS. Okay. Sorry, cops. So that includes the cops officer. In part cell. of part of their salary. That's why I deducted some because if I take it all out, then we're going to have it all come up the next year. So we're only going to have it bump up thirteen thousand next year, right? Because because of it got reduced this year. Is that right? That's my question too. Casey, the oh, cops grant is staging okay. down, is what they're getting at. The cops grant is staging down, and that's what you are trying to match up to is the cop grants staging down over a two year period. Am I saying it right? Yes, yes. So, because the expense is down here, it's going to shift up top the next year. So, that's why we don't want to take it all out because then it will be a big hit all at once. Okay, so just to maybe, all right. So cell D8 contains the sum of all officers, including the COPS grant officer, minus 25,000. Yes. Okay, yes. and if you scroll, so could we scroll down and look at the COPS grant, the COPS mm -hmm. grant officer down below on the same page? Yeah. So yeah. that one, we're budgeting, we spent, 72 last time right but keep in mind we only have the grant for three quarters so that's where the 54 comes from it's 75 percent of the 72. well we're assuming it'll be about this 72 but only 75 percent because we'll have it for only three out of four quarters of the year okay um and then we'll get the 25% reimbursement on the revenue side. Okay, so the total COPS grant officer expense is about 72,000? It was in fiscal year 20, yes. But we got reimbursed 75% of that during fiscal year 20 but it'll be, it's gonna be um, less in our current year and even less in the third year. Right. So, um, 
Okay, so it's, but I guess I'm just trying to understand how we're not double counting the cops officer base salary if that was already included in cell D8. But maybe I misunderstood. Okay, let me, um, I'm gonna look at one more thing and see if I can try to help you. We don't, make you know sense. what? If this is just me getting hung up on this, we don't have to do it in the meeting either. We can hash it out. Like I can talk to you on the phone and we can hash it out and- Sure, maybe email. that would be better, yeah. Yeah. Sure, we, I, we know we're not gonna be at a final draft tonight anyway, so yeah. that, that so would be let's, fine. Let's follow up, sure. is, that, is that okay with everybody? Everybody's happy to move on. All right. Thank you. Sid, thank you. And sorry, I didn't mean to like, you know, push you, put you on the spot or anything. I know I, part of it is just me trying to understand what's going on. So what else, what else has changed in our draft budget? Um, uh, the equity committee has um, changed their request in that's in line items. They had previously asked for 5,000 and they have changed to 2,500. And I, I, Kaylee had sent me, it's, it was in the shared folder, their kind yeah, of budget. outline of their expenses. Um, yeah, thanks. Where that was going to be expended. So if Kaylee wants to talk about that. Thanks, Kaylee. That was great. Yeah, absolutely. I apologize. I am not on video because I'm on my phone and I have to put my face so close to the phone to see the budget. Um, but yeah, so we adjusted, um, we adjusted the budget and I hope it was helpful to see um, what we're planning and spending the funds on. Um, we do, as you saw in the budget, we do have um, some committed donations, which is really great. Um, and the committee met on the 7th. We talked about how if there were to be a need um, which we hope there will be to um, have more either training or public work that we could either fundraise for that or at that time make a special request to the town. But as of right now, we thought it would be uh, good to start with uh, $2,500. And thank you. Yeah, that was just great to just see a couple lines of what you expect to spend it on. Thank you very much. And that budget will be in our town report, right? Just like all the others. Yeah, great. I would think. All right, what um, other change? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, are you gonna do, is somebody gonna do like a little narrative about the equity committee? Um, Cause it seems like maybe I would just put it in that section with the narrative. Um, Sure. Because That's I don't really know in the layout where I exactly I would put it, but if there could be a little write up like in all the other sections and I can just include that little chart in that narrative that would work best. What's the date that you need those narratives by? The sooner the better, but I would say like January 15th, maybe something like okay. that, middle of January. Does that include the select That's board the report biggest. too? Yeah. <sighs> it does doesn't yeah, it? it's just I mean, I mean it's just a matter of getting all the pieces in and then compiling it but if if they come in last minute then and there's any layout issues like it's just yeah the I mean I'm better. asking you know I'm asking for the townhouse for neck arts but yeah um yeah. yeah sure yeah all right so what else did anything else change in here no those were the those were the big things um, so, so if you wanna, I guess, do you want to see the, I don't know if you wanted to see the text little text table thing, um, the effect on that. Um, right. You, and this could, is, could you zoom in just a whisker? I'm having trouble seeing it sure. even on my uh, computer screen here. Thank you. Yeah. So hovering around a 3% increase in property tax, and that's just with a guess on the grand list at this point. Right, and um, I thought, I don't know if Alberta's still on, I thought she said um, she wasn't sure if the appropriations, we might have a couple of new requests on appropriations. So 
I, I don't know that for sure, but I thought she said there was a couple of new names maybe. So that's this figure here is last year. So. Um, we've had like six reach out wanting to um, know what our process was for this year. Um, so I don't know if there's gonna be any new ones that are gonna be submitting petitions or not. Okay, thank you for clarifying. I guess. Um, I would also just throw out if anybody's listening to this and is part of an organization that's requesting an appropriation, since it really seems very likely that we're moving toward Australian ballot, it makes it all that much more important that your description in your that you submit explains what you do and why you need town support, because there's not going to be a, you know, a floor discussion to, to support that. Um, so I guess my commentary on looking at this and looking, you know, when you sent it too, is that I feel like um, I feel like we've been through this budget enough, and we we've looked at it closely enough that we like our actual budget increase is down to a pretty small level, especially we when you consider that. Um, that a lot of our cost is payroll and a lot of our payroll increases on roughly 3% um, annually. So when we're substantially below that here, I think, I think that's pretty good. It's just that we're losing a bunch of revenue um, and that makes, makes it the total look a little rough. I'd like to go back to an idea I sort of threw out a week or two ago, um, or a meeting or two ago, I should say. Looking at the Town of Hardwick capital improvement three-year plans, um, maybe it's under buildings on your spreadsheet. Yeah, that one. Um, I've looked through these buildings and I know for a fact, I mean, we just spent, the Historical Society just spent over $100,000 putting in that new room, which included a completely new foundation. Um, it's been painted. There's going to be a new roof put on this summer, and that's taken care of. Um, the only thing that place needs is a fire suppression system. And already in this capital improvement plan, we have enough to pay for that. I'm not going to go after it. There's also grant money out there for to pay for a fire suppression system. I look at the library and they're on the brink of spending more than a million dollars to upgrade that building and expand it, et cetera. And I look at these, these savings account for these public buildings where we're accumulating money. It's a good thing to do. I'm not arguing against it. I'm just saying that that at least for some of these, it doesn't feel like they have the urgency that that just for one year only, they could go zero. It would not, if we just take out the library and the depot, that's $4,500. But if we took out all of them for one year, that's $50,000, which might make a little bit of a dent in the kind of tax increase that we're gonna be asking of people. It'll come back next year and maybe the debt will be bigger and we don't know what the revenues are gonna be. I mean, I, I know it's the sort of things that make real money people cringe, but you may have noticed I'm not a real money person. So I think you're, um, you're right, Wiz, that there's not a lot of urgency on some of those things. I think the thing that I try to keep in mind is that in a um, in a capital account like this, the kind of the exercise we go through in listing each building is to just like inventory our buildings and make sure we're aware that we, you know, these buildings will need some improvements. But the allocation isn't probably correct, as you can see from the negative balance in the memorial building in the highway garage. And so um, 
I guess what I think when I look at this is that that account just like the current balance isn't really that big. It's $95,000 in their total. The memorial building, for example, needs a fair amount of work on the slate roof. The public safety building needs to be re-roofed. I mean, it, it seems possible that we could chew through quite a bit of that. And I just and I just hesitate to to cut into um, any kind of capital budgets because it it compounds typically. Like if you don't add it right back in there, mm -hmm. it tends to compound because then you haven't added that to kind of your savings account. And I could add that um, at the at Neck Arts for the townhouse, we use this as an example uh, be, to be able to show what the town is, um, the town support or whatever for yeah. when we're doing grant writing. So if we were to zero, it would just, uh, I think it causes some issues down the line um, by, yeah, definitely zeroing it out. Um, and then I just know that fighting to um, have this be, you know, we just put the historical depot in there, you know, in, in past, recent years. It wasn't even recognized as a town building because it wasn't in there, you know? And so I don't, I, yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't really support that idea. <laughs> just say it. Okay, you've talked me out of it, but. Yeah. Are, are people okay to just basically uh, end discussion on this now and, and take it up again next time? I have three things that I wanted to just T uh, just uh, tick on. Um, the solid waste district rep that I have been serving in that position for a few years now, and I plan to continue to do that. Um, it seems like we could lower that to the same as the town um, service officer. So rather than a $500 amount, it could be 150. Um. Um, it's supposed to cover mileage and expenses related to going to the meetings out of town because they're usually in Barrie, Montpelier, Berlin, whatever. Yeah. Now that we're doing the Zoom thing, um, it, you know, this year it's been, I, I haven't, you know, but yeah, it just, it, it's just not necessary ultimately in my mind. And I'm sure that Larry spends a lot more than $150 being the town service officer. so. I don't know that I, I just think, you know, I know it's not a huge amount, but it's also not necessary. I don't, I mean, we could just do that. Um, Doesn't Larry have 250? He's a town service officer. No, he's got 150 right there for wow. an, increasing from 100 <laughs> is what I see anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, um, I don't know, you know, I, I can't speak to the others, but there's I actually two know. different things. There's what you were just looking at is the annual stipend and then under line items, there's town service officer expenses. So, right. so if, I'm yeah, talking so about the things. solid waste district stipend. Mm -hmm. So and you're saying $500 and it doesn't need to be that. I don't think you're saying it could be 150 the same it as the 150. Mm hmm. Sold. And that would cover mileage and stuff. And if somehow by some freak situation, it starts to cost me a lot more than that to go to those meetings, then I will certainly pipe up. But All there's right. no reason to have that in there. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> I, my second little item, I just wonder about, um, it's the, you know, it's the almighty fireworks line item, but because we have a credit, because of COVID and we didn't have our display this year, oh. that's $3,000 that we could zero out this in this budget because we're not gonna spend, we're not gonna spend it. Um, it could be, it could be otherwise used, maybe on ballots or mailing of extra things. 
having to do with the Australian Ballot Town meeting? I don't know. Well, so this this would be Memorial Day 2022. We already have the funds that we have the credit for are going to be Memorial Day 2021. Just just wanted to point that out. Right. So if we take it out, then there would there would be nothing for Memorial Day 2022. Okay. That's all. And we can't move it from 2021 because we can't. Right. Um, we cannot. Right. Okay, I yeah, then yeah. Good thought. But it's not going to get spent, so it's going. One's going to, but it doesn't flow over to this to the next year. It goes to the fund balance. Okay. Right, it goes to the fund balance because what we budgeted for twenty twenty one isn't going to get spent. Correct. I mean, assuming okay. assuming that we come in under budget, it goes to the fund balance. Okay. Right. Otherwise, it would get it may get spent in something else if we if we go yeah. over budget. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the fund balance, that would be my next uh, uh, item. And I just, um, I still think that it's perfectly logical to remove that police recruitment capital um, item that $7,061 and just move it into the fund balance. Mm, it's it sitting in capital something right now, right? Yeah, general something or other. General government. I guess I don't understand what you mean by move it into the the yeah. capital balance. It's it's okay. it was it's it's in our general government. I, as I understand it, it's in our general government because it has to do with the the when we no longer had a police dog and an officer to in the all the accoutrement that went with the police dog. So it couldn't go back because it was capital that was spent on that program. Is it, am I right, Eric? So I, I don't remember. When the yes, police dog correct. moved went away and the officer was no longer and so we sold the car or whatever that had all the canine stuff. And so that was uh, considered capital, so it didn't go into the police department account because it wasn't technically theirs. It was capital. And um, we put it in here under general government uh, with this idea that um, we would potentially use it for recruitment of officers, except that we have, and, and we're building more you know, so the $7,061 will increase over years by $500 to nine. Um, and we have a full force and the kind of dollars that are being put toward trying to entice officers to co go to police. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it does, it wouldn't touch it. It does, it doesn't make any sense. So why wouldn't we just get rid of that, put it in the fund balance, and then if we decide that we want to draw from the fund balance for to you know uh, alleviate the tax rate this year, the increase, or to you know pay for all of these added expenses because of the pandemic and the Australian ballot town meeting. I mean, it just seems like a, a it, that's a totally sensible thing in my mind to remove that it doesn't well so i don't know as though we would move it out of capital but you could certainly shift it to another category in capital that maybe needs it more i guess it would be my thought because we have a fairly healthy fund balance so um i would say if anything just you know if that was something that you decided to do just shifting it to a different category within the capital general fund not out of capital we we have to be careful in assuming that our uh, you know we're fully forced right now but just you, you can't assume you're fully forced moving forward and that applies for any of our departments yeah but we so. never had this before it, it came up because we had this money that came from that canine 
Well, we never um, had it before. I understand this in previous years. And just the only thing I would, um, I know Chief Cochran's not here this evening, but uh, in the previous discussions around this subject, I know there was some concern about, you know, what do we do in regards to offering incentives and the discussion about, we're not quite sure that's the right way to go, but um, just uh, we, it just just for consideration, you know, we do have a challenging time competing, um, you know, getting uh, competent officers. So I, you guys decide on policy how this goes, of course, but um, I, I think just us having the capability to offer some type of an additional incentive is valuable. Just that's what I would echo here. Yeah, I guess. I and again, select board determinations, of course. I was wondering how um, how flexible are capital funds? Like, if if we if we needed it in in something else later in the year, can we sh just shift it then, or do we need to make that decision now? Yeah, we can shift it with a vote in the year. As long as you don't change the dollar amount that was like by approved by the voters. Once the money's in capital funds, if you wanted to move in between, like you know, I want to move from fire department to memorial building or like whatever it may be you can move within the fund just not change any amounts that were approved by the voters well the voters just approve the budget right mm -hmm. they well no i'm saying like so say I mean, the, the, budget the budget is 150 or, or 120 thousand dollars moved into capital general that you can't play with but within these categories once it's in capital that's where it could be shifted that's what i mean so, so you're saying if we had a big need in a different category we could pull it out as long as it's a capital expense we could pull it out of there and shift it around shift it within capital we can't has to be within out. buildings has to be within public works as what you see on the screen here categories categories yes maybe so if uh, public safety so. came up short and highway was running strong and i know that's not the reality of it but just if that were the example well what's way ahead right now yeah. um historic yeah, depot depends. sorry wiz um historic depot is running strong memorial buildings down all right we got to make a little bit of a shift to cover the memorial building that's the example and i don't mean to say we're going to do that but just that's how you do it Okay, so but, but we can't go across categories. Could we go from public works to um, buildings or something like that? If we, we uh, not that I'm saying we should. I'm just curious. Is that a flexibility we have or no? No, I don't believe it. Okay. I thought we could with a vote. But... I, I think you can't like a board vote. You're saying yeah. yeah as yeah. long as you keep it in the in the fund, the capital general fund you can move in between categories. It's just the amount that the voters approved to go into the cap, that you can't play with. But once that money is oh. in there, you can shift between categories. So, so you may be right, but the, the voters, when we, at town meeting, what we vote on, the article that we vote on is just the total amount of uh, uh, the total dollar amount for a fiscal year. We don't vote on what portion of it is capital and what portion of it is regular. Well, that's part of the overall budget though. Like in line items, you say we're doing X amount into the roads, X amount to the capital right here, this capital. So like this capital general said 122. So if that was what was approved, I don't think you can be like, oh, we're only gonna put a hundred. I don't, I don't believe that you can do that. So I, I, don't, but, I don't think we should yeah. do that. I'm not advocating that we would or should. I'm just saying that um, what's actually voted on is not the budget. Like it's not the detail of the budget. Um, what's, okay. If you read you know, any of the old um, town reports and the warning, the the item that we vote on is a, a dollar amount. It's it's not asking the voters to approve the budget that the select, the, the budget is what we use to support the dollar amount that we propose. We just present this as our um, rationale for our um, the budget we propose. But anyway, that's this is an aside. So, all right, yeah. can we, um, can we let this rest for now and 
till next time and we have some food for thought. We had um, Casey made some changes. I'm gonna push uh, or push, I'm gonna push to understand a little better the um, police salary thing. I'm sure Casey has it right and I'm just not understanding it, but I wanna understand it. Well, we can connect, we can connect. Yeah, and we'll connect. Some calculations yeah. and stuff after the fact, sure. Great, and then Sherry gave us some things to think about as well. Is that is it okay to move on? Mm -hmm. Everybody, all right. I can't see Kaylee, so I'm just assuming she's good. Um, all right, so then, oh, we're at the end. Select board reports. Um, I'll just report the yellow barn is still waiting on word from uh, national border the. Yeah, NBRC, National Border Regional Northern Commission. Northern Border Regional Commission. Northern, thank you, uh, on the, the grant and that we applied for. Uh, new business, old business. AC, you can turn off your share screen. I just had a really quick thing, Eric. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention it's more of a public service announcement, but um, the neighbor to neighbor group, um, went above and beyond their 100 hats for Hardwick goal. I believe that they're at 179. So there are community wow. members, which is amazing. There were a lot of community members who knitted those hats and then Skeeta also donated a bunch. So they're going in the boxes for the food pantry and being delivered to families. So that is really awesome. Nice. Yeah. And then this weekend, the East Hardwick neighbor organization is going to be doing a cookie holiday cheer project where um, a lot of community members have made over 800 cookies and we will be safely delivering them in bags to families in the village to all houses in the village of East Hardwick. Nice that's fun. Mm -hmm. All right anybody else have anything? Going once going twice Oh, we have an executive session. I forgot. Need a motion going to executive session to discuss our dedication and uh, so photographs moved. and stuff. Second. So, so moved was Wiz, and second was Sherry. Mm -hmm. And um, all right. But so all. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So to include the town manager. All in favor. Who say aye? Aye. aye. 